good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good middle of whatever day it is you're jumping into this material. We're excited again for you to join the Valley of St. Louis Master Craftsman Study Group programs as we dig further into Master Craftsman Symbolic Lodge. Uh, today's discussion, uh, we're cracking midway through. We're on lesson four of the program, uh, just a couple after this left. So we hope you enjoy it uh, as we really are getting into what I consider the meat and potatoes of this uh, specific course, because we're actually going to start reading Pike's lectures on the Blue Degrees. Uh, we've covered some of his source material, some of the source rituals, places where he pulled from up to this point. Um, so now is the time where we actually get to get into the nitty gritty and break things apart. So we're excited for that. Um, and we're going to dig into it and hopefully you enjoy this discussion. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of retread material, which I'll touch on as we go. But we're excited to have you here. Let's get going. So we are digging again into uh, Symbolic Lodge as a program. Uh, again, brethren, just a quick reminder, if you're participating in the St. Louis Study Group specifically uh, or otherwise, please make sure you're reading the material before you are participating in this uh, virtual lecture discussion. Uh, this is just meant to be an overview to pick out and remind you of those points, maybe to draw your attention back to some things you, you've already read as you prepare. For those of you participating in the St. Louis groups actively, uh, we remind you that all of this needs to be, this needs to be read, this needs to be listened to prior to attending the in-person lectures and discussions that will review this material. So, we're going to be digging into the preface and introduction of Esoterica. And you've already probably looked through your syllabus and reading material, uh, saw what pages you need to read. And perhaps you're thinking to yourself, I think we've already read some of this. I think we've discussed some of this. Uh, well, that's actually true. Uh, this is a retread in some ways, uh, but also some new content. Um, Part of that new content is XLIV through LXVI pages, um, which is instructions on how to work through the text uh, itself, explanations on the appendices, some notes on Pike's style, uh, an extract from Pike with remarks on what Freemasonry was, um, and some extracts from Pike and his address to the Royal Order of Scotland. Um, and we'll touch on some of that. We'll hit on a few of these things. Um, he himself talks, at least in one of his discussions, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see, but have not seen what ye see, and to hear what, uh, ha, but ha, uh, to hear, but have not heard what ye hear. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, uh, because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing, all shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. Uh, that isn't Pike, of course. Uh, that is a, a quote he shares uh, in some early paperwork, or excuse me, in, in the introductory pages to the symbolism of the blue degrees of Freemasonry. And I think it's kind of interesting that he draws attention to this idea of um, symbolism, esoteric knowledge, um, seeing things things but not seeing all the way to what they truly are, hearing things but not truly understanding. Uh, interesting points made. So, quick review. Uh, just a reminder, when we look at the history of Freemasonry, we look at it through two schools of thought, um, and they contribute to our perceptions uh, and how we search for Masonry and its, its historical roots. The authentic school, of course, is based on research, it advocates the transition theory of operative masonry in Scotland and England uh, to the present forms. We see a speculative masonry. Uh, the Romantic school of thought believes in those Masonic legends, accounts, allegories, uh, circumstantial evidence, that type of thing. We can think of plenty uh, of evidence to either side of these as we consider them. Um, you know, one of the more recent um, authentic bits of research has come around. It came around around the 300th anniversary of the Grand Lodge of England. Uh, you know, we've for centuries, uh, in a one way or another, um, discussed the idea of 1717 is really the founding of the first Grand Lodge. 
Uh, of course, in 2017, 2018, uh, there was a, a litany of research that was unloaded uh, that pushes that number into some great consideration as being wrong uh, and actually being several years behind that. Um, a piece of authentic school thought consideration versus some of the more romantic ideas of 1717. Uh, we can find plenty of other ideas in line with that. Of course, Pike very early on tells us um, that he, in one point in his Masada career, put his faith in the fan fancies and fantasies about the Egyptian origins of Freemasonry. But he also tells us that the claims of mysterious or occult knowledge in Masonry are all but unauthorized pretenses. Um, I find that interesting that he says that uh, because his tone in other places may perhaps seem uh, in opposition. Early on, as an example, um, in our introductory materials, when we talk about the ideas of symbolism, the development of Masonic understanding of symbolism, uh, one text is just brought up and flashed in front of us, and it's The Spirit of Freemasonry, written in 1775 by William Hutchinson. Um, it is said to be the first book devoted to the symbolism of Masonry, um, and it helped, uh, by its publishing, develop a trend that pushed and promoted the accepted legends of the craft as history so it took what were then the legends um again the 1775 uh, by this point uh the grand lodge of england has been around the ancient grand lodge has been around uh you have a lot of the degrees that would become the scottish right solidifying things that are now in the american right of masonry solidified um masonry is hitting that booming point uh, as it heads towards the 1800s um his text, his consideration, and the text that came after helped really propagate this idea of accepting the legends of the craft uh, over any historical data of the time. When we also uh, take some time through our introduction, we're going to consider the role that Albert Pike played. Um, of course, some would say he's just a man, some say he's more myth, others will, of course, give him legendary status. Uh, in the end, he's a lot of things. He was the Grand Commander of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, from 1859 until his death in 1891. Um, generally speaking, we can ascertain that his study of Freemasonry taught him, uh, and it's noted within our text, that beyond the ceremonies of the craft, there were, there were lessons in social and moral values, and these were vehicles for transmitting uh, the symbols uh, to us for our understanding. It was at least indicated uh, in our reading that he reaches a firm belief that the symbolism of Freemasonry lays in antiquity. Uh, and specifically, he trends towards this idea that the Hermetic philosophers, uh, alchemists to some degree, perhaps even Rosicrucians, or at least those of a Rosicrucian persuasion, we'll go with that, uh, made their way into the lodges, the operative lodges, the early speculative lodges, prior to 1723, and that's something Pike holds to and believes. Um, as a Mason, uh, he has quite an interesting history. He was initiated into Western Star Lodge Number 1 in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1850. Uh, of course, he is a Northerner by birth, born in Massachusetts, uh, moving to the South, Arkansas, and interacting uh, in that state, as well as Louisiana, and in what was then Indian Territory through his legal profession. Um, several years after having joined Western Star Lodge, he obtained the, helped obtain the charter for Magnolia Lodge. He served as its master um, and, and was active there. Uh, and of course, shortly after joining the fraternity in 1850, he took the work of the York Rite upon himself. Uh, he took his chapter degrees the same year he joined the fraternity. Uh, two years later, he received the work of the council or the cryptic rite. Uh, and then the commandery orders in 1853 Noticeably, notably, also in 1853, he was communicated the 4th through 32nd degrees of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite. Um, and then six years later, elected the sovereign grand commander of that right. Pike makes his statements and his thoughts and considerations pretty clear. Um, he's not one to mince many words. Uh, and he tells us a couple things. Uh, in regards to his ideas about symbolism. He tells us that unless the symbol conceals some great cardinal truth of morality, philosophy, or religion, what is its real or substantial value? 
He reminds us that the religions of the world have always consisted, for the most parts, in worshipping the symbol instead of that which is symbolized by it. The symbols of the wise have always become the idols of the vulgar. And, and it's these mindsets, these concepts that draw Pike to consider uh, addressing, at least in part, a consideration for a review of Masonic symbolism and a study of it. Prior uh, to this text, we see as a whole. Um, here we title it, of course, Esoterica. That's kind of a, a cobbled name for it. Uh, it. It truly really is his, his lectures on the symbolism of the blue degrees as titled the symbolism of the blue degrees of freemasonry uh, but he did make two other stabs at this text uh in, in other ways in 1875 he has two lectures a lecture on masonic symbolism and then a second lecture on masonic symbolism his thesis in those texts was that the superiority of freemasonry to every other order and association consists in its symbols and it has no secret knowledge uh, of any kind now, there are qualifications behind his statement. His reference to secret information um, is in particular referencing and appealing this idea as being available to be made appealing to non-humans. Uh, Pike is writing this text uh, during the craze of spiritualism. Uh, this idea that you commune with spirits and seances and all that stuff is, is swelling more and more and more. So very much he's expressing this idea that Freemasonry does have symbols, it does have secrets, it does have knowledge, but it's not going to sit you down and help you in, in the sense of the spiritualism craze. Um, and so in these early lectures, he delves into two main focuses, uh, the symbolism of numbers and the Freemason's apron. Um, and he, at least at that time, considered the second lecture uh, on Masonic symbolism his last lecture on symbolism. Now, these early lectures, uh, which laid the foundation for Esoterica, were published under the auspices of the Royal Order of Scotland, which Pike at that time served as Provincial Grand Master, uh, and the lectures that led into what we have in front of us in that same vein. Well, he did have some trepidation about publishing. Um, he did have some concerns about, is it really worth it? Does it really need to happen? Uh, but it comes down to the idea and in, in his thoughts that if he doesn't put it to print, if he doesn't find a um, association to shelve it under for retention and spreading at some point or keep, um, it could be lost upon his death and, and it's wasted. Um, and so in writing these texts and writing the lectures that we now have in front of us, he corresponds with George Spieth, or Spieth who was the secretary of Quattro Coronati, uh, the oldest research lodge in the world uh, over in England. Uh, he expresses some of his ideas to Spieth uh, about what he's going to do. Uh, he also corresponds uh, and sends portions of these lectures to Robert F. Gould. Uh, Gould is a noted English Freemason. Uh, Gould has read some of the lectures on Masonic symbolism earlier that Pike had prepared. And he said as a result of these lectures, as a result of the material we find now here before us, he was persuaded to believe that the essentials of the Masonic ceremonial date to earlier than 1717. And he tells Pike that there is no one among our British Masonic writers who have could have written up to the level of your, your own performance. And I'm sure that filled Pike with a little bit of pride, a little bit of excitement there. Um, so he has these ritual or these, excuse me, these lectures on ritual and symbolism drafted. He has done some of the earlier ones. He's considering putting this one together. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He considers this lecture that we have in front of us some of his strongest work. Um, he's just not sure. And he's pushed by strong or arguments from his correspondence with uh, Gould, Spieth, and others to share his efforts, to make these lectures available to the craft. Um, Pike was honestly disinclined to do so. He wanted... And it really, to me, I understand his argument. He wanted those capable to appreciate the work. He didn't want to just throw it out at the wall and anybody who can grab at it can grab at it, but they may not be able to totally grasp it and apply it. Um, it's also worth noting that Pike, at least over certain periods of time, have been known to withhold and destroy his research to assert his right to it. Um, 
not everything he ever wrote or kept uh, for lecturing purposes made it beyond his lifetime. Um, and traditionally, uh, he made a very strong effort, as we would do today, that when he is lecturing on what he considers secrets, it was never transcribed. It was never recorded. It was never written down. Uh, his notations may be short, brief, to the point, if you will. And so while all this is going on, Pike has this great consideration of, should I publish? Is it worth it? We have all these brothers saying, you need to do this. You need to pass this information on. Um, and so he makes some considerations and, and ends up going forward um, with this project. This is a uh, quick insert copy, uh, just typed up and set of the um, transcription that would be inside the book plate uh, with the number, the date, uh, and telling you that there were only 100 copies would be printed, uh, belonging to whoever contributed to pay the cost. This copy is delivered and belongs to so-and-so. Um, agreeing, of course, that they will not allow it to be printed or copied. Uh, and not given to anyone except a prince of the royal secret or a 33rd. And that it has to be handed to a brother of that degree uh, on his passing. Um, so this is a, a book plate Pike would use uh, in several other ways. But this was an intended book plate if uh, for his other lectures and material and, and would have been for esoteric as well had there been that many copies printed. So, again, Pike has a big consternation about printing this and publishing it. Uh, he believes that it could be given to someone who is fit and qualified to teach and instruct the brethren. That would be key. That would be the best. Um, and he tells uh, the Royal Order of Scotland of his plan his intent for this lecture, these lectures, this task. And he talks about that there are two copies of the book. They contain an introduction, five principal lessons, and some fragments. Uh, and I will tell you from my own personal uh, preferment, I, I love this text, uh, his lectures. I, I find them highly enjoyable. Um, the fragments to me are some of the neater parts. Um, but he does note he's produced these two texts, um, but that these texts, at least, it, the copy that is in the house of the temple will never be permitted to be taken out of that building, even for an hour, by anyone. Period. So he has these two texts made. Uh, he has the one copy of the house of the temple. He, he sends one abroad. Um, and it comes into existence. And that's the root of our, our text we're going to read later. Uh, now, of course, this introductory material we're, we're discussing today also covers a couple other perspectives, a couple other things. And, and here we're going to touch on a few uh, random broad stroke ideas before we really hit into the introduction of the material. Uh, of course, active in masonry at the same time as Pike, also a big hitter, well-known author, uh, is Dr. Albert G. Mackey, or illustrious Albert Mackey, the Secretary General of the Holy Empire. Um at that time, uh, he very pleasantly and, and clearly tells folks uh, in his writing that he believed Masonic symbolism was derived from operative masonry. Of course, Pike doesn't agree with that, tells us several times it isn't true. Uh, Mackey, of course, expresses a belief that the substitute word used within the fraternity uh, or discussed in, in the text is uh, means, what is this the builder? And, and as an aside, of course, uh, Mackey, again, was an active officer in the Supreme Council. He served uh, Pike as the Secretary General um, until his passing. So, a couple other thoughts, um, and this comes from some of your assorted reading, uh, in particularly what Masonry was, uh, in which Pike talks a little bit about his thoughts on the Masonry, um, his thoughts on the world of Freemasonry at that time. Uh, Pike tells us um, of some of his concerns actively in this, and he talks of those who slight the Scottish Rite and other degrees uh, that come through it. Emphasize, and he emphasizes through that that the Master Mason degree is rightly concocted and no more part of ancient craft masonry than the degrees of the Lodge of Perfection. And so Pike here is kind of taking a, a poking fun uh, 
direction at this idea of those who would say that craft masonry is only three degrees and the master mason is the highest and all those other ones are made up and concocted and, and yada 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 and made arguments in that line or across that line or in that area uh, pike very clearly slights that whole statement out and says well you know what uh, the master mason degree is, is just as good a ground as the degrees of the lodge perfection and it's no more part of the ancient degrees uh, than those if you will in a lot of ways and he talks about the addition of the third degree was to add to the symbolism the institution to make masonry more worthy of the consideration of intelligent and studious men um, and i would i would draw your attention brethren uh, there's been several fantastic books written in the last uh five years or so uh about brother desigulier um, some of the early evolution of the United Grand Lodge of England or the Premier Grand Lodge of England at that time, um, and some of the early background, perhaps, that fed into that early Master Mason degree. He also takes some time to discuss kind of the broader impacts uh, of the fraternity and, and the symbolism and the right as a whole. He says, you know, during a larger part of my life, I've devoted myself to the development of 30 of these additional degrees. And of course, he's talking about uh, the Scottish Rite ritual. Um, and when we say 30, uh, a lot of Scottish Rite guys are going to say, well, there's only 29 degrees. Yes, 29 active plus the 33rd degree would make 30. Uh, and he talks about them constituting a rite more widely diffused in the world than any other. And to a study of the symbols of the blue degrees and endeavoring, endeavoring to exalt the first three degrees in the estimation of men. So Pike talks very earnestly about his his labor uh, to work for the benefit of the Scottish Rite, work for the benefit of the Craft Lodge, to understand the symbols of our fraternity. It is the fact it is the fashion to speak of the high degrees as injurious to symbolic masonry or ancient craft masonry, but it is far more easy sometimes to say a thing than to prove it. It is exceedingly doubtful whether blue masonry would become so strong had it not been accompanied by the high degrees. Uh, Pike here. Uh, bringing this this accusation, the fact that there are harsh commentaries made about different functions of high degree masonry, if you will, whether you're discussing the Scottish Rite, the Orc Rite bodies, whatever it may be, uh, and them having ill effect on the fraternity. And Pike here very clearly says, you know, what about the fact that maybe these lodges wouldn't even be functioning if it weren't for these other bodies? So that concludes kind of our overview of the broad strokes uh, preface material uh, that leads us into the symbolism of the blue degrees of Freemasonry as we actually dive in to these lectures that Pike developed. And I'm excited for that part. So I'm really pumped about that. Um, so take a second, step away, grab a drink, grab a snack if you want, uh, and then we're going to get started talking through the introduction and the introductory materials of Esoterica and the symbolism of the blue degrees of Freemasonry as outlined by Albert Pike. All right, hopefully you got that drink. Let's get going, folks. Uh, we are gonna dig into the symbolism of the blue degrees of Freemasonry uh, and specifically the introduction material. So we're gonna cover that. Uh, that goes from page 75 up uh, until the first lesson, so 88 in your text just so you have kind of a, an idea of what pages we're tackling here. Again, keep in mind, brethren, uh, this is meant to be introductory and overview. Uh, this is not the full breadth of the content we would normally discuss in an in-person meeting. Uh, this is just to kind of remind you of those key points, get you to think a little bit, get you to dig a little bit more. So we're going to dig in. So, the introduction kind of gets our, our pace set for this text. Uh, it covers some general commentary regarding Freemasonry. Uh, and so we'll hit on those big points uh, as we go through. Pike likes to note, at least off the bat, that Freemasonry conveys philosophical truths by the use of symbolism. And he reminds us that every intelligent Mason knows that of every hundred of brethren taken, within the degrees, within the fraternity, not more than two or three regard the symbols of the Freemasonry of any real value or care to study it. Others will see it as idle and unprofitable labor. Uh, I think that's an interesting thing that he points out. Um, in a lot of ways, I think that could probably be applied to today's fraternity, uh, perhaps in, in one form or another, um, although not completely across the board. 
Uh, he does say that he means not to isolate Masons, as he tells of speaking to thousands of Masons, and they not are no less anxious to learn or be attentive to those comparative to those holding high positions or the intelligent or the educated. So very much Pike says, there's a whole bunch of Masons. They're all coming through. There's very few that really want to value the idea of studying it. A lot will see it idle and unprofitable, yet they are interested. Even, even the ones out there that may not seem so, they're no less anxious to learn and attentive than those who are just dialed in. And I think that's interesting to talk about uh, because I do think that applies. We have brothers, no matter their station, who are going to find some level of interest within the fraternity. He tells us uh, very clearly a couple of his concerns. I uh, I used to like to talk about some of these sections, um, and we'll hit some of them later, as Pike's past master rant and complaints. Um, but he talks... Uh, very harshly about certain things and, and issues with them. He tells us of the cable toe, Pythagoras, the compass's position, several symbols, um, and his immediate thoughts, as well as what he was never told or explained. Uh, and of course, he mentions several other things. Uh, kind of make a list in your head as, as you think back. You know, he talks about when a rope was put around the neck of one of these, uh, referring to a, a man of intelligence, a candidate of, of intelligence and good thought. What can he suppose it is a symbol? But slavery degradation the choking of life out of a malefactor he may agree to its use only to be told it helps him leave the room if he refuses to proceed um pike takes time to discuss pythagoras and the 47th problem how its explanation does little he even notes of course as many of us would probably be aware that it was archimedes who cries eureka when bathing and discovers the principle of displacement he references a couple other commentaries Terry points um, in regards to symbolism and how we use it. He talks to the idea that the tools of labor are used as symbols of religious truth. Um, but why are they symbols of religious truth? He tells us they're to glorify, to consecrate, to dignify, and a noble work. But how does that fit for us? He references the idea that much of our ancient symbolism is perhaps irrevocably lost and it's disappeared. Uh, he talks of the gnawing tooth of time, uh, which is just ripped away some of our greatest possible lessons um and, and he uses in that context this discussion of a flag uh and he talks about this idea of the flag and it's it's changing meaning uh, and how one may interpret it one way and to others it is is completely different uh, and he talks about how that relates to these ideas of symbols changing and the meanings of these symbols changing and their development keeping on the same train of thought with this idea that ancient symbolism is gone he references like i said the truth of time uh, and he says that it could be by several routes it could be by omit by omission of what is not understood so something is just simply cut away because well we don't understand why they did that so we're just not going to do it anymore as a practice uh and of course then he follows that very aggressively with the discussion upon the innovations of the ignorance or half knowledge which is worse than ignorance uh, and he specifically zones in in a discussion about the master's word as an example. Uh, and, and I think before we go into that train of thought, I, I do want to hearken to this because I think he brings a great point out. This idea of the changing nature of eternity and its symbolism um, and its lessons that are changed by omission of not what is not understood, innovation uh, of ignorance or half knowledge. Um, and we've seen that in, in various bodies with ritual being changed, things adjusted over time, perhaps. Uh, and we can see that as we look to older practices, older concepts. I, I'm often intrigued when I have discussions with brothers here in my own jurisdiction uh, about certain past practices, certain activities, and, and brothers don't understand, well, why would we have done that? And when you explain it, light bulbs come on and they're like, well, you know, that's why don't we do that anymore? Well, it, it kind of fell by the wayside. It was either too much effort or people didn't remember the reasoning behind it um, or it took too much time. Um, but I, I digress. Uh, that's, that's my rant for the evening or day or wherever we're at. Um, and he uses, again, the master's word as this example of the tooth of time. Specifically, um, he talks about the interchange um, of what induced a brother to become a master mason. And I want you to think through your head how your own ritual addresses that today. Um, and I will take you through the steps that he addresses it with 
um, in the text specifically, and these are his words. Um, he says that long ago, when a brother was asked what induced him to become a Mason, he would answer that I might obtain the master's word, comma, and be therewith enabled to travel into foreign countries and earn master's wages. Now, that's a profoundly symbolic statement, uh, Pike points out, uh, referencing the Debar, the Debar Yahava, the word of God. Uh, God. Um, yet, Pike points out that this idea of obtaining the master's word and then going off in foreign countries and earning wages. Okay, priority is the master's word, then we do everything else. Uh, that's how Pike sees it. And he says, Masons then only see the literal meaning, and they sought to better the phrase and changed it. So, improving it, they change it to this statement um, that he now notes in his text as, that I might obtain the master's word and be therewith entabled to travel into foreign countries and earn master's wages, comma, and thereby, be thereby better than able to support myself, family, widows, etc., etc. Pike clearly notes here that thus, by changing the logic of how this statement lines out, we've destroyed the base symbol, the base meaning, the base intent, and we basically made it more important about finding money and labor. Pike notes that the vulgarization of the reply by changing it from emphasizing the master's word to master's word and then getting wages um we have demeaned the response to a tool for wages to be profitable um and thus we're being prostituted by the most ignorant and brutish laborer in his service and it's contradictory of course to the craft as pike notes and he considers that the candidate is then required to state on his honor as he's entering into the fraternity, that he has no purpose uh, in view of being initiated for monetary motives. Yet, then he's prompted uh, within the work several times to say, I'm not here for mercenary motives. I'm not here for monetary motives. I'm not here influenced by business. And yet we then stand within a room and Pike points out, we make this statement, uh, which very much... Uh, in Pike's opinion, is a declaration by lying and obtaining initiation than by fraud, in a way, uh, by our own statements. Pike further notes that the master's word itself, as a word, has probably not in 275 years uh, had a, mace, a mason heard it in a blue lodge. And Pike specifically alludes to the fact that this word, or at least a form of it probably, has been surrendered to a degree in another order that the Lodge gave it up. Uh, and of course, he's referring here to the Royal Arch. Of course, there is no credible evidence uh, that the Old Master's word was actually taken from the Crash lo Craft Lodge and given uh, to the bre the companions of the Holy Royal Arch. Um, but in any case, um, that's Pike's argument is this idea that it's been surrendered to another group. Uh, and has been long lost, and we have no idea even what the original was. Among the other commentaries in the introduction, um, Pike shares this short statement. Uh, have you seen your master today? I have. How was he clothed? In blue and gold. Um, or if we're waving the ritual a little bit back farther... Um, it would be a blue jacket and a yellow pair of breeches. Now, this statement is one of interest in that it flips around a little bit thoughts and commentary, and it shows that Pike was not always uh, word perfect in his memory um, because he inverts the color and the ritual. The jacket is actually said to be yellow and the breeches are blue. Thus, the yellow jacket represents the compasses and the blue breeches, the steel points, that's referenced in Masonry Dissected by Samuel Pritchard, which we read. Um, additionally, Pike, in his discussions, uh, talks about traveling from uh, Gibbon to the threshing floor of Ornan the Jezebite. Um, and that, of course, is uh, an error transferred to his 14th degree ritual in the Scottish Rite. Um, it should also be noted that he references from the lofty towers of Babel where the language was confounded and masonry lost and from traveling from the threshing floor worn in the Jezebite where language was restored and masonry found. Uh, that comes in line with some South Carolina ritual at the time 
uh, where Pike drew the phrase. It, of course, uh, alludes and relates to the idea of leaving darkness of the profane world and progressing to light and knowledge. Pike kind of flips some of his uh, points there to make it more functional to his considerations. You can read more about that in the text itself. Uh, again, Pike goes on this little past master's rant and he jumps to a couple different things he thinks are worth noting that he has problems with. Um, and he discusses the cable toe again. He's already mentioned it once. He's going to talk about it again, and it will not be the last time he complains about it. Um, Pike in his introduction notes, the man swears to take an oath and upholding it within the length of his cable toe. Yet he is ignorant to what that is, and no explanation is given to him what that is. Thus, a man is made to swear by a solemn form of oath that he will do certain things under a condition which has no meaning to him, uh, and a meaning to which is uh, equally unknown to him who administers the oath. Is it not a crime to swear a man so? Kind of an interesting point Pike makes. We're going to talk about the cable toe at length later, uh, so I just leave that there for your own thought processes. Um, of course, Pike points out some other ideas and concepts. He discusses the number three in length as a symbol, um, just generally hitting on these ideas, you know, uh, that their signs are threefold. The word of the third degree is three syllables. There are three years in the service and age of an apprentice. The Mr. Clatter has three rounds. There are three principal officers, three supports of a lodge. Uh, you can see this list. Um, uh, of course, there are some corruptions to it. Uh, the Mystic Ladder, uh, often referenced, or the ref Ladder of Jacob, uh, is a bit corrupted. The typical Mr. Ladder, of course, has seven rungs, symbolizing uh, attainment or perfection. Uh, of course, in the Bible, the Jacob's Ladder, we don't actually have a specified number of rungs. Um, but in the Craft Lodge, three is generally the use. He closes his introduction with a couple simple thoughts. And he, and he tells us that I have often repeated to Master Mason, heard repeated often to Master Masons in lodges and Grand Lodges assembles, the lessons of Masonic symbolism that will be found written in the following pages of this manuscript. The explanations given by me have been so imperfectly remembered that they begged me to repeat them by letter. If I do not write them out, they will be lost when I die. And knowing this to be true and that the day of my death must soon come, I address myself to the task. Um, and I think it's important we note that he realizes his, his death, his mortality is waning. Uh, it's 1887 when he writes this introduction. The text is finished in 1888. He dies in 1891. Uh, and of course, he charges those whom he entrusts with this work never to permit the multiplication of copies of this book, which I think is funny since we now can easily get a copy of it. Uh, but he never to, to permit the multiplication of copies of this book and not provide it to anyone who isn't fit to teach it. He prays that misfortune and ignominy befall anyone who doesn't meet those conditions. With that, my brothers, this concludes the introduction and the preface of Esoterica and Pike's Lectures. I hope you've taken some time to dig into it, enjoyed it. This is the fourth lecture in our Symbolic Lodge series here brought to you by the Valley of St. Louis Master Craftsman Study Group Programs. We're excited for it. If you've got questions, feel free to always reach out to us uh, and let us know. We'd be glad to elaborate on a section or whatever we can do. Uh, with that, we'll see you for the next lecture down the road. Have a great day, evening, afternoon, whatever it may be.